Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, and this is uh, Think Tech Tech Talks. We're talking about tech. We're talking about Nalu Scientific. We're talking about how it develops high performance electronics equipment right here in Hawaii. Uh, not in Waimanalo, but in Nalo. It's quite different. Yeah. And uh, Isar uh, Mustafanajad is here with us. Um, he's a physicist, a PhD, and uh, he, he's fast. You know what I mean? Watch out. He's fast. So uh, welcome to the show, Isar. So nice to see you. Hi, Jay. Thanks for having me. So let's let's get something off our chest, okay? You had something you wanted to say consistent with the press lately. It's about some grants you got. Tell us and refer to your slides so we can sort of get past that and drill down. Ready? Go. Sure. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Uh, this is a really exciting time for us. We have been working on this project for the past few years. Uh, at Nalu Scientific, we are designing advanced microchips that help scientists uh, measure time uh, or time essentially down to uh, you know less than a pic or down to a picosecond, which is the trillionth of a second resolution. Uh, so talking about fast, these electronics have to operate really fast, essentially. Um, and if uh, if Eric wants to bring up the the picture of the microchip that we have developed, the Artwork chip, essentially that's the uh, you know one of the grants that we've recently gotten, and um, Again, it, everything that happens in the world uh, is analog, as you would imagine. When, when you talk, when, what you see uh, and uh, what you hear, everything is analog. But uh, computers don't speak analog. They speak digital in order for you to compute or calculate or do any sort of uh, uh, characterization of what's going on in the world. You need to convert this information from analog to digital. And that's what we do. We design microchips that operate very fast and they can operate, they can convert signals that happen in the analog world, which is the real world, into the digital world and such that the scientists or engineers can, can do their processing on those. That's yeah, let's take a look at some slides. Uh, we have a number of slides, one that sort of demonstrate what your, what your company, your laboratory looks like. Here's one. Can you describe that? Yeah, sure. So this is about us a little bit. Uh, again, fast growing startup. So thanks, uh, thanks for the plug there, Jay. Uh, we are experts in integrated circuit design. So integrated circuits, microchips, microelectronics, essentially are the same word uh, for this little square, tiny square that you see in one of the pictures that's sitting on the top left, for example. And, and these integrated circuits are, have been around since the 60s, essentially. That's what has brought us here, revolutionized uh, our, our world the way that we know it. Uh, we are work, working on a customized version of this that allows scientists measure, you know, the speci specific qualities of time at a, a very fast. You had, and you had some shots of your laboratory and your the equipment you use and, uh, and the ships you develop. Why don't we take a look at those two to get a, an idea? Yeah, sure. Let's go to uh, maybe, uh, yeah, slide number nine. We can probably jump a few slides there. Um, and, and this is... Uh, you know, we, uh, you know, on the right, we have the picture of the microchip attached to a printed circuit board. Essentially, if you open your computer or your, your you know, uh, phone, you see a bunch of these things, but these are specialized for this application. In the middle, you see one of our staff members uh, 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 soldering things together, especially the microchip is fabricated. We don't fabricate the microchip, we do design. So we, you can categorize us as a fabless semiconductor company, essentially, that doesn't have its own fab. Uh, and it, it doesn't make sense these days to fabricate these, these microchips. So we, we, we design these, send the design files, that, AKA CAD files to the, the facility, they fabricate it, they send it back to us. And then now we have to test it and, and make sure it, it is what we designed essentially. So we do all that, that type of assembly work in-house. In-house in Manoa, in-house at UH. Right, yeah, everybody's here at the, at the, the Manoa Innovation Center. So we have a small uh, office there. Uh, it's, quite, it's a quite flexible uh, uh, you know, area slash office building. It's a, essentially an incubation space for new tech companies that can, can access at a reasonable uh, discounted rate. I mean, last thing you wanna do as a, you know, as a cash burning startup tech company is pay a lot for rent. So that's the that's ability that we have there. There's good internet and you can go to their website and, and figure out how to become a tenant there too. Yeah. Well, I can go to the newspaper and try to figure out how much grant money you've had in the past few years. And I get like $5 million. 
But the question is, uh, you had to burn through that pretty quickly in order to come up with some of these uh, chips and devices and electronics. Uh, how does that work? Absolutely. So it, it, it's a, a lot of these uh, developments are, are very uh, labor intensive because we're doing design work. And, and by design, I mean uh, engineers with, with tens of years of experience in, in this art. And I call it art because it's beyond technology to some extent. You know, you have to kind of see a little bit through the computer screen and uh, it's not just moving boxes around and coming up with a design. You have to really know what you're doing essentially. And we're really lucky to have staff members that, uh, that have kind of leaped to that other world essentially. And they can, they can you know, bring that art. And, and people say electronics is an art. And uh, there are books called Art of Electronics, for example, from, from back in the 60s or 70s. But it is, you know, every day that we're doing this job, it's a, a really labor intensive uh, uh, process to design these microchips. So that's, if you're asking where the money is going, I can tell you that's where it's going. And then you have to prototype it, fabricate it, design it, come back and test it and all that. So yeah. Yeah, and, and testing is really important. I, I want to digress for a moment. I was watching uh, Amazon last night and I can't remember the name of the movie, it was an odd name. Um, about a bunch of guys back in the early 80s who decided they were going to reverse engineer the BIOS in the IBM PC. And uh, you had a really hands-on look at how they did that, uh, checking out all the numbers on all the ports on the BIOS and the BIOS chip. It was amazing. Never seen a popular movie like that. It was very interesting. And it's a window in case anybody's interested in the kind of thing you're talking about. We have to be infinitely patient, have to go one step at a time, you have to test it all, write it down, test it again, and so forth. Um, and, and the creativity must have give you a huge sense of satisfaction. Absolutely. There's a lot of creativity involved, but as you mentioned, it's very methodical too, what you mentioned, to be in the lab, take the data, test it, measure it, compare it with your theory, what you were designing for, right? And so it's, it's, it's very, uh, you need to be very patient and you need to be very methodical. And I can say that we have uh, staff members that, that are to that quality. Yeah, and you want to design, uh, say, a chip or um, any kind of electronic, you know, small device. Um, it's not just one aha. It's not just one, you know, eureka. It's a series of eurekas and you're, you're learning, testing, creating and going on to the next one. And then you're going through it all again to make it better and in your case, faster. Um, I'm so impressed with that, that it's happening here. Uh, anybody else doing it here? Or are you the, the only company in Hawaii that's doing it? Gosh, uh, it, I've heard of other companies that are doing you know, small chip design projects. And uh, what you mentioned is absolutely right. You, you have this little box with tiny, you know, one centimeter. If, you, if Eric wants to go to slide number two, I can show you a little bit there. Uh, there are millions technically, literally millions of transistors on that little chip on the, the black box on the left under the hood. And if, you know, if I, even if I showed you what's inside it, you won't be able to really see what's going on there because it's not enough pixels to describe it. Uh, but, you know, and if one of those fails, you get a brick. It's pretty simple, <laughs> right? So the, the, the you know, margin well, is really a brick, slim. Is our, what's a brick? Uh, you know, you can use it for as a keychain, essentially, Got instead it. of right. taking it to, to the processing that you want to do, basically. Yeah, put it in the bottom of a fish tank, yeah. Yeah, yeah, something like, I don't know if you want to put it in a fish tank, because, you know, it might it might not be good for the fish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, oh, but uh, that's you know, the what, level what, that we're operating. So, um, you know, I'm getting the idea that this is, um, the, these chips uh, that you're inventing uh, have, have have extraordinary uses uses um, that are that are awaiting you. And I guess my first question is, are, are, are these chips de deployed already or are they at a point where they're not yet deployed but are of interest to other electronics manufacturers like computer manufacturers and sensor manufacturers uh, or, or devices that use sensors, I should say. Um, and they're, they're only waiting for you to say, okay, we have it on the market. Is that what they're waiting for? Yeah. I I don't think these will be going into a computer or a cell phone. Um, these are a little bit more specialized than that. And uh, so we are right now, the, the current version of these microchips are actually on their beta testing at facilities in the, the mainland US and also Japan and, and uh, some in Europe actually. Um, and, and these are in use by scientists and research facilities that, that will need them. Um, in general, our plan is, uh, 
you know, to, to really build on these chips and go to a value add situation. Let's say, okay, this is a microchip. We have this underlying technology. Now it's patented with our name on it. So, you know, we made this great, but we really need to kind of bring it to the application world. In the first application world is experiments in the physics world, like the, you know, similar to the Large Hadron Collider experiment in Switzerland. And it, it's a very niche application of our microchip. And that's what we've been getting funding and uh, to promise to them that, you know, this will be coming their way. And there is a next generation experiment that's going to be happening in the United States. It's called the Electron Ion Collider uh, in the, at the uh, Brookhaven National Lab in, in, uh, in Long Island, essentially. So well, we're, we're working with the end users, potential end users there. I mean, we're talking, you know, five to 10 years down the road that they're, they'll be building this essentially. But we're working our way to make sure that we, our tech is a match with their needs essentially. And so all, all the beta testing is, is going forward with that. Well, you know, what I don't understand is exactly how you, um, how you conceive of, of a given um, device, a given technology, a given discovery, um, because you, you have to know what they want at Brookhaven. Uh, what do you do? You call them up one day and say, hi, Brookhaven, my name is Izar. I'd like to build something that you need. What, what do you need? How do you, do, how do you structure what you're doing to meet whatever they want? Right, so my background is electrical engineering. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by how these microelectronics things work essentially. Uh, but the way that I got familiar with this world of, of the customer uh, and their needs was if you go to slide number three, Eric, for example, you see an experiment that I was involved with that was in Japan. So I was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Hawaii. And uh, that's where they were, uh, that my task was to go to Japan a lot and work on this experiment as an expert, essentially. And I learned a lot. You know, I, I can't claim that I was really an expert. I was bringing something to the table, but then I had to learn a lot. And if you go to slide number four, Eric, uh, there you see, this is how this, this facility looked like in 2015. And it's a 900 member collaborator, 26 countries involved. It's a very big, and when I say 900, I'm talking 900 PhDs in physics and engineering. So I was working with them day in, day out and learning from them and learning what their pain points were. were. So that was 2014, 15, 16. And, and then that, that kind of started me to scratch my head and, and realize that there could be a market for this technology essentially and hence uh, you know, find resources and figure out a way to start a company essentially to be able to cater to this world. So you have, you have to follow the action. <clears throat> you have to follow the action globally. You have to know who's doing what, where, and how. Um, uh, exactly. That means you got, you got to go to conferences or at least uh, correspond with uh, scientists and, and developers all over the world. Uh, are you still doing that even in the time of COVID? Absolutely. So the... It, from 2016 to 2019, essentially, we had this campaign of really trying to publish the work that we've been doing. I mean, patent as much as possible and then publish the results as much as possible. So we get some protection, but at the same time, we get the word out there. Uh, we can't be making this in our cave. We have to be interacting with the end user. So that's what we did. We went to lots of conferences and we made lots of new contacts and connections. And there was excitement. And, and these were people that wrote us letters of support uh, when we were talking to the funding agencies you know the funding agency in this case united states department of energy uh, would tell us to go and work with the end users and and listen listen to their pain points so that's what we did through conferences technical meetings and all that and uh, they now the majority of end users kind of know our name so that's really a good thing uh, the times of covid yeah it's we're not exactly getting on the plane every other week to go places but uh, Everybody is doing the same thing, which is nobody's getting on the plane. <laughs> so uh, no, you can talk with Zoom. Absolutely, that's what I'm saying. So everybody is Zooming, and I am actually getting more meetings in in a day than than I used to. And uh, you know, 8 a.m. to, in fact, actually 6 a.m. because I got to start with the East Coast time uh, to like 5 p.m. I I barely have time to scratch my head. So it's back to back. It's just jam packed. You know how much how many people you can talk to in a in Zoom calls these days. So it's a bit of a blessing in the disguise despite all the challenges that it has brought us. Yeah, yeah there's two sides to it because you can work harder this way. <laughs> so you, you have you to know, make up. You spoke about um, um, the Department of Energy and I, and I saw that in the newspaper and I wonder uh, what you've described doesn't immediately call energy into mind. 
what's the connection between what you're doing in the Department of Energy? Unless they just like to be very generous and charitable to you, what, why do they care? Right, that's a very good question. And that was my question in 2015 also. So the Department of Energy has uh, this thing called the Office of Science which is a $7 billion a year entity, essentially. And they, they cover very basic scientific discovery in the United States, in the physics world. And uh, their budget is the same size as the budget of NSF, essentially, National Science Foundation, which is responsible for covering a variety of research, right? So DOE now has the unique opportunity to be really focused in the type of discovery they can fund. And in this case, really understanding the matter and, and energy and matter down to subatomic level is what they can do. And so that's, that's what they have been able to, uh, they, they fund these discovery experiments and they will, they will need electronics for those. And you know, we walked up to them and, and knowing that they are, they're the funding agency, you know, we started talking to them and, and said, hey, you know, this, is, this is what we can do. How can we get it funded? And then they, have pro they had programs to help us find our way in terms of how to get this funding in place. So hopefully yeah. that answered your question. Yeah, well, it sounds like you have to be creative and, and uh, go, where, go where the scientific interest and where the funding, of course, is. The other thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, talk about, um, you know, the meetings with the scientists, with uh, engineers, with physicists, of course. And um, it actually reminds me of a movie, another movie, sorry, one more movie. Uh, called The Queen's Gambit, which is, I think, also on Amazon. It's about a young woman who's a prodigy in, in chess, okay, in chess. And at night, when she lies in her bed and she thinks about chess, she sees the chess pieces on the ceiling uh, wow. over her. her. Her mind is organized, you know, to visually, graphically see the board wherever she goes, with whatever she's doing. And I wonder, you know, how it works for you as a developer of this kind of electronics. Um, do you do you see the pieces on the ceiling? Do you walk around in a in a kind of matrix, a graphical matrix of how you make a chip? And do you see it from the eyes of a physicist, which I really would like to know how physics relates to what you're doing, the eyes of an engineer, maybe an electrical engineer? How do you see it and what does it look like? And how much of the time do you spend imagining what you're doing? Right. Gosh. Well, thanks for uh, comparing me with these, you know, really amazing stories and, and movie stars, and it's really flattering. Uh, but to answer your question, I think there are multiple aspects to it. I mean, the tech is is very important. Uh, I do think about the technology a lot, the the bits and pieces that go in it. Uh, but at the same time, uh, my focus has shifted a little bit into making sure that we get the business side correct, also. So I'm not a I'm not a businessman by trade. I'm an uh, engineer that has been now is, is getting training on the job essentially to be able to run the business and, and grow the business essentially. So uh, when we started, uh, my, my mind was a lot, you know, involved with the technology aspect of how do we design this little transistor so that it would, it would connect with this other transistor, the chess pieces essentially, and, and get them talk to each other in a way that they will create the desired result. And, you know, in a, in an engineer's mind, that's, you know, number one, you keep thinking about it a lot. Sometimes you dream about it. Um, I work with a lot of people that are in that caliber. And so I'm, I'm, we're very lucky to have, you know, system architects and, and really good engineers at the company that are doing that on a daily basis. So that I can say that they are taking care of that aspect of it now. I have kind of, you know, kind of handed that, that aspect to them. Uh, but then I, what I do is walk around and think, okay, where else can we use this little microchip now? How can we get this next customer up and, and making phone calls, be in touch, strategizing a little bit? Who can be the, the, the distributor for our technology potentially? We're a, a small company on an island. How do we get the, the word out to the world? You know, so we need to work with collaborators essentially. So that's that's the aspect that is taking sleep away from me, if, if that's your question. <laughs> you play chess, Isa? When I was little, I did, but uh, it's been a long time. So, yeah. You're way beyond that now, okay? <laughs> so talk about business, okay? It's not like you're getting an email from, I don't know, someplace in Europe and they say, Izar, can you, can you send us uh, 25 units or 100 units of your newest device? It's not like that, right? When you say business, the business right now, correct me if I'm wrong, is really uh, getting grants to go to the next step rather than doing manufacturing to satisfy an existing market that knows what it wants from you. 
Um, but uh, tell me how far along the path you are on that and where the path goes. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're kind of making a transition now. We are getting these phone calls and, uh, uh, you know, scientists or, or, or uh, engineers that, that want to, you know, try our device, essentially. So, uh, which is really exciting and heartwarming. And now, now we have to fulfill orders. So we're like, okay, uh, how do we do that, right? So we're, uh, we're, in, in, uh, you know, we're doing that transition right now. But at the same time, uh, you know, we understand very well that you know, we, we have an R&D machine that's running fast and is, uh, is guzzling gas, essentially. So we wanna make sure that the R&D team is busy doing what they're really good at and they're funded to do that too. So that's, that's kind of my job nowadays to make sure that you know, as the number of manpower uh, FTEs actually increase the company that we have really amazing problems for them to solve. Fast, uh, we're back to fast. So what, what, um, what is uh, the secret about fast? I mean, if, if you had to describe to me how you make electronics uh, sensors, uh, these chips really fast, faster than anything that we've seen and heard of since, you know, ever before, what, what's the secret to it? How do you make it work really, really fast? Right, so there, there, uh, maybe there are two aspects to it. There's microelectronics that operate fast, and then there's a team that is capable to make these in a you know reasonable timeline fast. Uh, I don't know which one exactly you're referring to, but I can I can uh, cover both essentially. Are you talking about material science? Are you talking about nanotechnology? No, we're still actually we're using uh, really uh, uh, kind of the you know the the day to day use you know CMOS process, the semiconductor. Uh, you know, kind of a vanilla CMOS process, essentially. We're not, we're not doing anything in the material science yet. Um, but there is a lot of unknowns that, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, design tricks left still to make the semiconductors go fast. So um, that's what we're doing. And, and the way that we do this is we use older semiconductor technology and we design and in, in really specifically for those older, for the older uh, technology because they're a lot cheaper to fabricate, prototype, if you make a mistake, you can prototype again, right? And the uh, and the design tools are a lot cheaper too. The design tools to use the older technology is a lot cheaper too. So, uh, but we we have to spend a little bit on the manpower to really you know do that you know make sure that the design actually operates in the in the way that we want to. And when you're talking about semiconductor industry or, or any sort of hardware design, fast is the is the last thing you want to think about because it's just such a time consuming process. Um, it's not exactly software that you can code and, and I don't say software development easy or anything like that, but if you make a mistake, you can go back and fix things. Whereas, you know, for designing a microchip, you spend, you know, maybe six months designing it and then you have to wait for three months for it to be fabricated. And if you're lucky, the fab house is fast enough for you. You're talk talking about a year before you can have something in your hand that you can just turn on and what we call a smoke test. Turn it on. Okay, great. It didn't catch fire. It's number one. Now let's see if it's actually doing what you wanted it to do. So um, it takes a long time. They they had the smoke test in that first movie I mentioned. At half the time, it would go up and smoke. <laughs> Oops. Exactly. I've uh, yeah, I've witnessed a few. So every engineer has yeah. So let's talk about, uh, you know, you, you mentioned a couple of times patents, okay? And I assume that the Office of Technology uh, in U UH is helping you get patents and you've gotten a few patents uh, around this kind of technology. Is, that, is it so? Uh, they, what, are the, what are the terms? What, are the, what, what's, what kind of service do they provide to you in that regard? Right, so I just wanna clarify one thing real quick here that uh, we are, a, you know, we're a separate entity from UH. We're actually a you know, LLC. And uh, when it comes to relationship with UH, we are, uh, what happens is we subcontract some of the work to the University of Hawaii. Got it. So they, they own their part and they do whatever they want with it. But the part that is ours uh, is essentially, is, is given to us based on the, the terms of the grant is given to us essentially. So mm -hmm. we are allowed to patent those and, and you know, create protection for ourselves. So uh, the patent process, you know, I've been in and out of it uh, here and there throughout my previous companies that I worked on. And so you basically, you have to describe what you're doing and you wanna make sure nobody else has done it before. So you do a little bit of a, you know, um, uh, uh, what is it called? You're, you do your uh, due diligence to some extent, right? 
and then then you you write in a paper what you've been doing and you know add pictures and things like that and then that's what we did and then we 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 worked with a patent attorney uh you know independent of, of any institute or anything like that so then we we managed to to file for patents and actually get get awarded those yeah well, that's, uh, <clears throat> well it brings another uh, point of uh connection into mind and that is that you have to follow the prior art just as you write the papers you have to read the papers uh, all over the world uh, to see what the prior art is so you can distinguish your invention from all that uh, otherwise it's not going to be easily patentable yeah you know? um, exactly <clears throat> well all that being so uh, that's pretty that's pretty exciting for that to happen in hawaii it really is um, do you see the, you know the possibility of an industry here you see the, I mean, not necessarily doing exactly what you do, but doing the kinds of things you're doing with the kinds of talent that you're bringing in on your staff. Do you see that as, as possible either in Manoa Innovation Center or elsewhere in these islands? I think the answer is yes. The, the question is, is if there's willpower, if there is you know, enough outreach and uh, knowledge and kind of, uh, yes, we can behind it, right? Uh, I think there are many, many, many unsolved problems in the world. And I think the answer to that is how do we solve these problems? And so it, it, I think it's a combination of subject matter expertise, workforce, think about the ways to design around the problems or, or design solutions for the problems. Start with a little island situation. You know, if, if we can fix problems that are relevant to the island, then maybe we can expand it to the continent or to the world. Right, so this, yeah. uh, you know, this is one way to look at it. So is that what happens if somebody from Silicon Valley calls you up one day and says, look, you know, we have a lot of venture capital we want to give you. We like you a lot. We've been following and watching you. <clears throat> and uh, we'd like to, you know, support you and invest in you. We, we can find you space. We can find you additional staff. Uh, we can help you in every way. Uh, why don't you come down here? Why don't you relocate your LLC to you know, California, what have you, and, and we'll make you happier than you've ever been. What happens then, Isa? Right, right. So there are two, two things here. One is that uh, you know, the, the venture capital is, is going after you know, cases that they can actually get maybe a billion dollars in return, right? Um, and then uh, in what we were working on is not exactly a billion dollar market, right? It's a small niche problem, but it's a respectable size problem. It's enough for a small business to, to work on and keep people employed and kind of grow and expand on uh, in a place like Hawaii. So um, we're quite happy with that, to be honest with you. Um, and if, if there is an aspect of our technology that Silicon Valley really wants to get their hands on, uh, you know, this day and age, a lot of things are happening remotely. I mean, nobody's working at Google Office right now, right? So, and guess where the Google employees are? A lot, my friends work there and, and they're all around the world now. So why would you want to even be there, right? So uh, I think the COVID has taught us a lot of things and, and that's one of them. I know a lot of tech people that have come to Hawaii and, you know, looking for, for a place to live or, or at least short term, test it out essentially. And so, we are we are from Hawaii, so we don't really want to go anywhere at this point. Um, <laughs> so I think we can we can probably learn a few things, take a few pages from this COVID experience, and and see what can be done. Okay, with that lesson, and with the you know the vision that it's a it's a hard vision, but with the vision that COVID has given us uh, uh, has required us to look at over the horizon. Where do you see your company going in the next few years in terms of projects and electronics, in terms of market, in terms of uh, you know, global connections with other organizations that might be either collaborators or, 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 or users of your technology? Where do you see it going? Gosh, I wish I had a crystal ball to answer that. Uh, but uh, you know, we, we will continue to do what we're good at and what we've been getting better at, I think. Uh, that's, that's the first answer. And the, I think there's, a, there's an understanding that science is making discoveries in the world. Even this COVID situation, somebody made a real fancy microscope to, to take pictures of the virus and it's everywhere now, right? You can see it everywhere. And, and there are facilities in the United States and in the world to really, really you know, fancy 
uh, with fancy electronics and, and imaging capabilities to, to really take pictures of these down to microscopic and, and in our case, atomic level exper experiments that happen. Um, so I, I feel that that, that will just uh, be more demand for potentially electronics, type of electronics that we make uh, because those machines are essentially imagine the size of a six story tall building filled with electronics, right? And I don't say Nalu will build all the electronics that go into that, but if we take a you know, 5% bite of that, that's gonna be enough for us for a long time. Um, yeah. So I think the, the answer, short form answer is, uh, you know, countries and hopefully our country also will still be on path to fund uh, science and technology for creating discoveries that we might not know what the you know, next year use is, but we will know 10 years from now, it will answer a lot of questions. When radio waves were discovered, uh, they, didn't, they didn't call them radio waves. They didn't know what to call them. And nobody knew that, you know, what it could be used for until, you know, first telegraph was transmitted, you know, wirelessly. So I, I don't want to compare us to that, but, you know, there are lots, lots of things that happen that we just don't, don't find a way today to use it, but we will. Yeah, and all I can say is if we can see the virus, we can figure it out maybe better. We can figure a solution to this virus and other viruses, and that will be a uh, that will be a great contribution to humanity for sure. Well, thank you, Izar. Izar, uh, most most of Vanazed, I guess, most of Vanazed. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for coming around and spending the time with us. Really appreciate these discussions. Aloha. My real pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs>